Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I see you've already invited yourselves to eat. I invite you formally to eat, so I'm glad that you're enjoying what we've provided for this noontime talk. Um, I'm Eileen Julian, director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and we are the sponsors of the Henry H. H. Remack seminar, which we uh, intend to be annual as much as possible. Um, and that seminar is complemented by a distinguished scholar lecture. And as you know this afternoon, Steve Sanders, who's an associate professor in the Morrow School of Law, is going to be the, the, the speaker. Um, Steve uh, submitted a wonderful proposal, um, which rose to the top. And so we're very pleased um, to be sponsoring this event. Um, I, it, so it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here uh, with respect to this. And I just want to say, I want to start with a few words about Henry H. H. Remack, whom some of you may have known. I probably most of you didn't. Um, and it's in his honor that we sponsor the seminar uh, and lecture. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about the seminar itself and then a short introduction of Steve Sanders as its leader. Henry Remack was born in Berlin, Germany in 1916, so that was like 100 years ago, let's get that perspective, and came to the United States in 1936 on an international YMCA in, um, scholarship that provided funding for young Jewish refugee scholars. Upon his arrival, he was sponsored by the IU Bloomington chapter of Sigma Alpha Mu, a fraternity with strong Jewish ties. This would be the beginning of a lifelong involvement with Indiana University. After earning a master's degree from IU in 1937 and a PhD from the University of Chicago thereafter, he returned to IU as a professor of German in 1948. He helped to establish the Department of Comparative Literature in 1949 and West European Studies in 1966. And the um, West European Studies has now become Euro. Um, he served briefly as chair of German studies, then as chair of, of comparative literature, and also as chair of West European studies. From 1969 to 1974, he was vice chancellor and dean of the faculties. He officially retired in 1987, but he volunteered to teach undergraduate honors courses from 1987 until his health began to fail in 2005. He was director of the Institute for Advanced Study from 1988 to 1994, and interim director from 97 to 98. Over his lifetime, Henry published widely on modern German literature, on the discipline of comparative literature, on Franco-German literary and cultural relations, European romanticism, German and European realism, and student movements and countercultures of the 1960s and 70s. He received innumerable awards. He passed away in 2009. With the support of his family and colleagues primarily, an endowment was created that has enabled us to hold what we would like to be an annual Henry H. H. Remax seminar and distinguished scholar lecture. One of Henry's most important legacies to the Institute is faith in collaboration across disciplines, among faculty on campus and with colleagues coming from afar as a source of deeply humanist and intellectual insights. The Institute for Advanced Cut Study put out a call for proposals for this year's REMAX seminar in spring 2016. And as you know, Associate Professor Steve Sanders' proposal rose to the top. Its theme is dignity, equality, and social justice, a theme I think that is most appropriate for our times. Steve observes that dignity is often invoked in discussions of human rights and politics, but that the concept has, in fact, received very little attention. Today's lecture, then, is one of several sponsored by the REMAX seminar this spring, alongside an exhibit at the Lilly Library that we invite you to, to visit. Now, just a word about Steve. Steve Sanders is, as you know, an associate professor in the law school, where he has taught constitutional law, constitutional litigation, and family law since January 2013. He is also an affiliate faculty member in the departments of political science, gender studies, and at the Kinsey Institute. Steve began his career as an administrative staff member at IU Bloomington in 1986, ultimately serving as assistant to the chancellor and as an assistant dean of the College of the Arts, College of Arts and Sciences. 
In 2005, he earned his JD degree from, um, from the University of Michigan, uh, where he was an articles editor on, the, on the, the, the law review. He received the Bates Memorial Scholarship, that law school's highest award to graduating seniors. He clerked for the Honorable Terrence T. Evans of the Seventh U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals before practicing for four years with the Supreme Court and, um, and the liter litigation group at, at Meyer Brown LLP in Chicago. He became the firm's most junior attorney to present a U.S. Supreme Court argument in a paid client matter. He has represented, among other clients, the ACLU, the American Association of University Professors and, and groups of university uh, faculty members. Before joining Morris School of Law, uh, Steve taught at the University of Chicago Law School as a lecturer and at Michigan Law as a visiting assistant professor. His current scholarship focuses on the 14th Amendment guarantees of equal protection and due process, with a special focus on how these questions affect LGBT individuals and their families. He also has interest in higher education law and academic freedom. His scholarship has been published in the Michigan Law Review, the Hastings Law Journal, and the Indiana Law Journal, among others. In addition to scholarly publications, he writes regularly for the Huffington Post, SCOTUS blog, and the blog of the American Constitution Society. So I'm going to present Steve to you. I just also want to thank the Morrow School of Law for supporting these series of lectures. And thank you all for coming, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Uh, this is uh, what I'll be talking about today is part of a larger project. One of the reasons I submitted the proposal along the theme that Professor Julian described, dignity, equality, and social justice, and we've had a variety of both small and large programs over the year focused on that, is because I took such an interest in this idea of constitutional dignity, specifically in the wake of some recent Supreme Court decisions that I'll be talking about today. So it gave me an opportunity both to pursue some of my own work and some of my own ideas while tying it into the larger history of this idea of what do we mean by dignity. Um, as I say, this is part of a larger project. I want to thank my law school colleagues and, and the administration that's been so supportive of my work on this and other things, uh, my students who are here. Uh, I want to acknowledge particularly Allison Scarlett and Patrick Robichaud, if they're here, uh, uh, former students of mine who provided really great research assistance uh, as this project evolves. So thanks again for being here. The, the the concept of human dignity has a history stretching back 2,500 years, but in the 20th century, human dignity became a concern not only of philosophers, um, uh, uh, but also of constitution writers, constitutional lawyers, and the international human rights community. In the United States, the word dignity does not appear in our constitution, of course. But nonetheless, the Supreme Court has said many times in several different contexts that dignity is a constitutional value. This constitutional value of human dignity has been said to underlie various doctrines and policies under the first and fourth and fifth and eighth and 14th amendments. Um, dignity as a 14th Amendment value, which is my focus today, has acquired special significance uh, since Obergefell versus Hodges. In Obergefell, the court through Justice Kennedy used the word dignity no fewer than nine times in the course of striking down state laws that prohibited marriage equality for gays and lesbians as violating both due process and equal protection. The court had also invoked dignity in two earlier gay and lesbian rights cases, United States versus Windsor and Lawrence versus Texas. In the wake of these three cases, and especially after Obergefell, scholars have sought to understand the court's use of dignity. Is the word dignity in these cases just an embellishment, a, a grace note, uh, something that the court, meaning in all three of these cases, Justice Kennedy, uh, has employed in order to lend poetry and gravitas uh, to judgments that have been criticized as lacking strong footings in traditional doctrines of equal protection and due process? Or as scholars such as Kenji Yoshino and Lawrence Tribe have suggested, might we be seeing the beginning of a new doctrine of constitutional dignity, one that has potential promise and power to bring the 14th Amendment to bear in new ways on how the government 
uh, treats individuals. Um, the overall answer, I will suggest, is, lies somewhere between these two poles. Um, concern for dignity has always been a part of the basic DNA of the 14th Amendment. After all, protecting the dignity of the nation's newly free African American citizens was a moving force behind its ratification in 1868. Um, Today, I will argue, this, when the Supreme, Court, the Supreme Court speaks of dignity, when it seeks to illuminate the social meaning of particular forms of discrimination. In turn, when the court articulates the social meaning of discrimination, it demonstrates that constitutional equality is a dynamic and evolving concept. In the final lines of Lawrence versus Texas, the 2003 decision that invalidated criminal laws against sodomy, Justice Kennedy famously wrote that those who had drafted and ratified the 14th Amendment knew that, quote, times can blind us to certain truths uh, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper in fact serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. Justice Kennedy was writing in that case specifically about the guarantee of liberty under the Due Process Clause. Sort of in a nutshell, my argument here is that when the court grounds a decision in the dignity of an affected group, these same insights that Justice Kennedy has been talking about apply in the same way and in the same force um, to the Constitution's guarantee of equality. Um, so just so we're all working with the same context, let me briefly review how the court invoked dignity in the three most recent gay and lesbian rights Cases. In Lawrence, the court mentioned dignity three times. It discussed the loss of dignity that attends a criminal conviction. It declared that dignity may not be taken away by government as a consequence of the individual's choice to enter into a particular sexual relationship. And it placed the liberty of gays and lesbians in their intimate relationships among, quote, the choices central to personal dignity and autonomy that are protected by the Due Process Clause. Um, again, Lawrence is formally categorized as a due process case, but because, as the majority noted in that decision, liberty and equality are linked in important ways, and because the most important practical consequence of Lawrence was to eradicate a form of anti-gay discrimination, um, I will really be discussing Lawrence as an equality case. The second case, United States versus Windsor, decided in 2013, began as one of numerous cases in the lower courts challenging, uh, uh, brought by married same-sex couples challenging the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Um, DOMA prohibited federal law and the federal government from recognizing same-sex marriages in any form. In Windsor, the court said DOMA violated equal protection because, quote, interference with the equal dignity of same-sex marriages, a dignity conferred by the states in the exercise of their sovereign power, was more than just an incidental effect of this federal law. It was its essence. This interference, this disadvantage and stigma came not only from DOMA's expressive power, rendering gays and lesbians second-class citizens for purposes of federal law, uh, and it came not only from the practical disabilities that it imposed on same-sex couples, making them ineligible for uh, in many important federal benefits, subsidies, and responsibilities. Um, it also came from the fact that DOMA interfered without any proper purpose in legal rights that had been granted by a different sovereign by the states. The courts emphasized that states had begun conferring on same-sex couples the, quote, status and dignity of legal marriage. DOMA directly undercut this dignity and made it less meaningful. And in the third case, Obergefell decided in 2015, the court made nine separate references to dignity. Um, and it must be said, at least on a quick reading, the use of dignity in Obergefell is so varied that it can seem to lack any unified, coherent meaning. The court refers to the dignity of customary man-woman marriage, uh, the dignity of gays and lesbians in their own distinct identity, the equal dignity of men and women as a principle against discrimination on the basis of sex, the dignity and the bond between two men or two women who seek to marry and in their autonomy make such profound choices, and finally the offense to dignity that is involved when one state refuses to recognize another's legal marriage. 
But I think all of these references in the opinion taken as a whole um, ultimately contribute to the opinion's most resonant and enduring statement about dignity, which comes in its very last line, that state laws forbidding same-sex marriage offend the Constitution because they deny same-sex couples, quote, equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The problem with denial of equal marriage was more than just an unjustified differential treatment. It was about, quote, stigma and injury that attached to those who had been turned away from marriage. In other words, it was about dignitary harm. And so um, stepping back and considering these three cases as part of a larger doctrine, what work is dignity doing in equal protection law? When it speaks of dignity, I'm arguing in this project, the court is reflecting back on the larger American society how it believes our society has come to regard a particular form of discrimination, whether it is just or unjust, whether it is linked to preventing an objective social harm. For example, we wouldn't give any weight to the dignitary consequences of anti-burglary laws on people who make their living breaking into houses, um, or whether the discrimination instead has, become, has come to be understood um, as something that was once thought necessary and proper, but now serves only to oppress, to quote Lawrence. It may seem unremarkable to say that it is never a proper government purpose to enact a law that harms someone's dignity, but evaluating a dignitary harm requires an understanding of the larger context. In other words, when it articulates the dignitary harm that a law inflicts, the court is providing its interpretation of the law's social meaning. How members of the affected group, as well as other citizens generally, now understand and perceive that law's impact and operation in a way that may be different today than it was at the time the law was enacted. Um, this channeling of social meaning is not necessarily anything new in constitutional law. As Professor Michael Dorff has written, expressivist notions of harm are deeply embedded in American constitutional doctrine. In Brown versus Board of Education, for example, the court candidly acknowledged that the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group, the exact opposite of the view that it, it had insisted on in Plessy versus Ferguson. Charles Black famously wrote about Brown, that the purpose and impact of segregation in the Southern culture were matters of common notoriety, matters not so much for judicial notice as for the background knowledge of educated people who live in the world. In more recent years, the court has observed that racial classifications of any kind carry a danger of stigmatic harm and may in fact promote notions of racial inferiority. Similarly, in its equal protection sex discrimination cases, the court has said that the principal evil of laws giving differential treatment to women and men is that they risk publicly validating false and more to the point, outdated assumptions about women's capabilities and roles. In Roberts versus J.C.'s 1984, the court observed that discrimination based on archaic and overbroad assumptions about the relative needs and, cap needs and capacities of the sexes forces individuals to labor under stereotypical notions that often bear no relationship to their actual abilities. It therefore both deprives pers it, it, it therefore deprives persons of their individual dignity. If I'm correct that founding these decisions on, on dignity is the court's way of capturing and reflecting back the changing social meaning of a particular form of discrimination, that still doesn't explain the role that dignity plays in moving equal protection law as a whole in a particular direction. It's one thing to observe that the Supreme Court often feels free to interpret the social meaning of a discriminatory law or practice, but I think we also have to take seriously what this means for doctrine. Um, my colleague, our colleague, Dan Conkel, has written that when the Supreme Court interprets the capacious language of the due process and equal protection clauses, its task is art as much as science, judicial statesmanship as much as technical craft. The court mediates past, present, and future, identifying individual rights that befit the evolving political morality of our society. Now, I think it's surely correct to say that our society's political morality evolves, yet it's more, co it's more controversial to suggest that the Constitution's meaning um, should evolve and change alongside. 
Dignity, I argue, can link social change to more enduring constitutional principles. In the gay and lesbian rights cases, dignity was the vehicle by which the court translated this evolving social morality into constitutional law. If a particular discrimination serves a valid public purpose, it means that the group that's adversely affected by the law will not be heard to say that their constitutional entitlement to dignity has been infringed. But conversely, when the court asserts that dignity has been violated, that represents a conclusion that the discrimination is now understood, not just by the court, but in the larger society, to lack such a valid public purpose. Even someone who's not comfortable with the idea of a living constitution um, might agree that a government motive to harm a particular group with no significant countervailing social benefit or public regarding purpose um, violates the basic meaning of equal protection of the law. This is a neutral principle. As Justice Robert Jackson wrote in his concurring opinion in the 1949 Railway Express Agency case, equality is not merely abstract justice. There is no more effective practical guarantee against arbitrary and unreasonable government than to require that the principles of law which officials would impose upon a minority must be imposed generally. So it's, it's axiomatic um, that in our legal and political culture, arbitrary treatment by government is universally considered an offense to our dignity, both as citizens and as humans. Um, dignity anchors social change in constitutional principle by declaring that for the purposes served by the law in question, we now understand in a way we did not previously that the human impact of the law on the interests of the minority and the majority can no longer be distinguished, whether it's about sodomy or equal marriage rights or other things. Um, this idea can, I think, be regarded as a sort of a form of popular constitutionalism. It demonstrates a court in conversation with the larger culture about the meaning of constitutional rights. Robert Post and Reva Siegel have called this process democratic constitutionalism. Uh, Jack Balkan uh, explained in writing about Obergefell, uh, as Jack Balkan explained in writing in the wake of Obergefell, this process is not democratic in the sense that judges respond directly to elections or that they are mirrors or representatives of the public, um, but it is democratic in the sense that the courts are players in what Siegel and Post call constitutional politics, that judges live in the same culture as lawmakers and politicians and ordinary citizens. The suggestion that the court engages in this kind of dialogic process in shaping constitutional law is not an original insight, it's the subject of a large literature, but the court's use of dignity, I think, provides a lens that helps understand this phenomenon in actual operation. Not just the gay and lesbian rights cases, but also cases like Brown and Loving versus Virginia, as well as the court's sex discrimination cases, all show that legal conclusions grounded in dignitary concerns, even if the word dignity isn't used expressly, grounded in and dignitary concerns seem to become more prominent in the, in the court's constitutional vocabulary when we're at a major turning point in how society understands particular forms of discrimination. 17 years ago, 2000, before Obergefell, Windsor, or Lawrence, uh, William Eskridge at Yale theorized that, uh, what he called an evolutive equal protection clause, an equal protection clause that evolves, uh, which he said offers marginalized groups the possibility that if traditional norms against them weaken, the judiciary will force the political process to clean up remaining exclusionary policies. Um, my argument here is that the dignity reasoning of the gay and lesbian rights cases validate this understanding, show that that Eskridge was actually thinking and writing ahead of his time. Um, to say that our political morality has evolved is to say that our eyes are now open to seeing in a way that, we're, that they were not before how the affected minority group experiences discrimination as demeaning, a stigma, an insult, because that is how the majority, which expects to be treated with dignity, would experience the discrimination if it were applied to them.
This involves more than just the court saying, well, society is ready for this particular change in the law, and so we should feel free to go ahead and make it. Rather, I think, it is to say something different. Um, society now understands the meaning and human consequences of the discrimination in a qualitatively different way than it once did. And that difference now has constitutional significance. For example, in Lawrence, the court read broad social meaning into the continued existence of sodomy laws. It declared that when a state criminalizes sodomy, we now understand that the effect of such laws is to demean the existence of gays and lesbians, to assert improper control over their, over their destinies, to deny them their dignity as free persons. In Windsor, the court said the effect of DOMA was, quote, to impose a disadvantage, a separate status, and so a stigma upon all who enter same-sex marriages. Doma told those couples, according to, the, according to the court, Doma told those couples and all the world that their otherwise valid marriages are unworthy of federal recognition. And in Obergefell, the court said that state laws barring same-sex couples from marriage, quote, impose stigma and injury of the kind prohibited by our basic charter. When the opposition of legislators or citizens to same-sex marriage becomes enacted law and public policy, the necessary consequence, the court said, is to put the imprimatur of the state itself on an exclusion that soon demeans or stigmatizes those whose liberty is denied. The imposition of this disability on gays and lesbians serves to disrespect and subordinate them. Now, I think the widespread acceptance of these decisions, the, the social consensus, notwithstanding a few isolated continued pockets of resistance, such as North Carolina, which is currently trying to nullify Obergefell, um, uh, notwithstanding that, the widespread social acceptance of these decisions, the, 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 the acceptance that they were correctly decided, suggests that the court got it right in interpreting the evolution of the social meaning behind sodomy laws and marriage prohibitions. But none of this, of course, is to suggest that legal conclusions, conclusions based on dignity um, uh, are easy or inevitable. The social meaning of discriminations will often be contested. There are legitimate concerns about, just, uh, about jurists opining about something that could be dismissed as speculation or bias or simply the court purporting to pronounce on the meaning of things that it lacks the role or the competence to declare. Um, some would argue that the court, if the court is being faithful to its role in our constitutional system, for a decision based on dignity to be regarded as legitimate, um, its understanding about the dignitary consequences of a law must be grounded in, a, in an objectively valid understanding of the social consensus that already exists, or at least a social consensus that's clearly emerging at the time of the decision. Others might argue that the court's interpretation of social meaning of the dignitary consequences of discrimination should be more aspirational, more educative, uh, that a particular discrimination should be regarded as offensive to the dignity of the affected group, even if society is still in the process of accepting that understanding. Um, perhaps it's telling that Justice Kennedy, the author of these opinions, once told an audience at Harvard Law School talking about the role of the Supreme Court, he said, by our opinions, we teach. Um, this, the potentially malleable nature of dignity is illustrated, I think, by how it's come to be used in the court's jurisprudence on affirmative action. Um, as I've already suggested, principles of dignity, even if that word was not used expressly, were embedded in racial equal protection cases like Brown, Loving, and others decided by the Warren Court. And these dignitary principles were linked to an anti-subordination understanding of equal protection. But as the court turned more conservative in the 1980s and 90s, dignity came to be employed, sometimes expressly by this court, to support the more formal colorblind understanding of equal protection that we have today. In City of Richmond versus J.A. Croson in 1989, the court said that principles of dignity were offended by a city's minority set-aside program. The court said the city's program, quote, denies certain citizens the opportunity to compete for a fixed percentage of public contracts based solely on their race, and therefore, 
to whatever racial group these citizens belong, their personal rights to be treated with equal dignity and respect are implicated by a rigid rule erecting race as the sole criterion in an aspect of public decision making. The court's conservative majority here, led by Justice O'Connor, saw dignitary harm here to both whites and blacks. Whites because they were denied equal, equal opportunity in the formal sense. Blacks because in the, in the eyes of justices, at least like Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas, affirmative action itself reflected invidious assumptions about African Americans. <coughs> in holding that all racial classifications must thereafter be subject to strict scrutiny, the court seemed to be saying that it at least felt that American society had come to a new understanding about race and the Constitution. Whether this reading was correct remains the subject of vigorous disagreement. Um, this example indicates that even if dignity continues to play a prominent role in, um, the four in 14th Amendment cases, there will still be many arguments about how to interpret the social meaning of discrimination, whether dignity is offended or not. For example, should the so-called should so-called bathroom bills, like North Carolina's notorious House Bill 2, be properly understood as simply baseless attacks on the equal dignity of transgender persons? or do they reflect legitimate concerns about privacy and safety? Um, and I think although there's always the danger that here in a law school or at a university, uh, we will simply reflect the attitudes of elites, I think that the widespread ridicule of HB2, its disavowal by law enforcement agencies, its condemnation by business interests and by an organization as mainstream as the NCAA, uh, I think all of that stands as pretty solid evidence that HB2, had it not been repealed in the past week or two, um, could have been vulnerable to the same sort sort of dignity scrutiny that the court provided in Obergefell. Um, interestingly, reference to social meaning may make it less necessary for a court to search for animus or invidious motive or intent before it strikes down a law as violating equal protection. A finding of animus is, in the end, a conclusion about a law's purpose. This makes animus doctrine controversial because when animus is invoked as a reason for striking down a law, the law's supporters may believe, often with considerable resentment, that they're being labeled as agents of hate or bigotry. By contrast, when a law is said to have harmful implications for dignity, that analysis can represent a conclusion not so much about the law's purposes, but simply about its operation and effects, how it impacts the affected group, and how it influences perceptions and attitudes about that group in the larger society. The intentions or the motivations of the government or the law's supporters viewed in this way um, become less relevant. And sometimes, as in, Bergef in Obergefell, they're not discussed at all. Although the court said in Obergefell that these laws demean and stigmatize, it stopped short of actually saying that that was the intention, that that, that was what was behind the rhetoric or the debates or the public discussion of these laws. It's striking the extent to which Obergefell says virtually nothing nothing about improper purpose and certainly never mentions animus, even in, the even in the course of some very strong language calling out and describing the impact of those anti-marriage laws on dignity. Um, take, for example, a case currently pending in the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals concerning Indiana's laws governing when children are considered to be born in wedlock, quote unquote. And being born in wedlock gives rise to the legal presumption um, that both spouses are legal parents, even if it is not proven that they actually both had a biological connection to that child. Um, as currently written, the law does not accommodate same-sex couples who cannot procreate naturally and who could not marry in Indiana until 2014. Um, this is not a law that was intentionally aimed at making life harder for gays and lesbians, as labeling them unfit as parents or attacking the legitimacy of their marriages. The law simply predates the reality of same-sex marriage. Yet, I think the 
smart money is probably on the bet that the Seventh Circuit, like the district court, will find the law is unconstitutionally valid in light of current realities failing to provide same-sex couples with the same security in their parental rights that heterosexual couples enjoy, assuming that same-sex couples somehow have less need for that kind of right and protection, um, denies them, whether it is intentionally or not, denies them the same kind of dignity that centrally concerned the Supreme Court in Obergefell. Um, cases presenting clashes between LGBT rights and religious liberty will be more difficult, I think, uh, to take an example currently pending before the Fifth Circuit when a state, post Obergefell, carves out broad new religious exemptions for government employees or business owners who are religiously opposed specifically to same-sex marriage, should we conclude, based on a common understanding, based on a reading of the social meaning of these laws, um, that they offend equal dignity, that their operation and effect is to demean and stigmatize? Should we conclude that they are nothing more than, as the district court put it, the state's attempt to, to put LGBT citizens back in their place after Obergefell? Or are these laws simply an extension of the kinds of benign and acceptable religious exemptions that have long been thought to be um, necessary compromises that allow the impact of general laws to be moderated to accommodate bona fide religious belief and exercise. Um, one answer to this might simply be, at least for now, that perhaps lower courts should not be in the business at all of attempting to define the boundaries of the Equal Protection Clause through this lens of social meaning. Uh, perhaps that task is only something that a constitutional court like our Supreme Court really has the competency and the role and the legitimacy to do. And so in summary, uh, dignity under the 14th Amendment is an important limiting principle on government power over an individual's life. But rather than grounding constitutional law, either in static and outdated original public meanings or merely grounding it in the subjective values of judges, um, dignity analysis, as the court has demonstrated it to us, um, seeks to harmonize constitutional law with evolving yet still object objectively determinable values about who should and who should not be excluded from the baseline standards of regard for our humanity that the majority certainly expects from its government. Uh, to be legitimate, um, uh, this analysis, I think, though, still requires, to paraphrase Woodrow Wilson, a Supreme Court that can discriminate between the opinion of the moment and the values of the age. So thank you, and I'd be delighted to, to hear your reactions or comments and questions. Thank you. Carl has the microphone, so this is uh, this remains a work in progress. This is one aspect of something I'm writing, so um, so I, I very much appreciate feedback, suggestions, reactions. <laughs> the faculty members, of course. All right, <laughs> take the lead. Give us, provide a good. Uh, thank you, um, and thanks, Steve, for such a, a marvelous lecture. Uh, Starting from your premise that the, the, the application of the concept of dignity to a given group or set of laws arises from a change in social meaning or social understanding of the impact of, of certain laws, I wonder if, if there's been much um, thinking or research yet or whether you've thought about what it is that gives rise to that change and whether, and I'm talking now from a sort of historical um, positive rather than a normative point of view, uh, I think, for example, some people might argue that uh, the change in the understanding of racial discrimination uh, in part was made possible by World War II mm -hmm. and the national sort of unification of that unique event, the subsequent integration of the armed forces by Harry Truman. All of that meant that thereafter it was sort of inevitable that people would view. Um, Maybe with LGBT rights in some obscure way, the AIDS crisis by shining a spotlight on the lives of, of uh, gay men and their relationships may have in a, in a way. But is there, have you thought in any broader sense of a theory 
of how it is that the, the change of the magnitude uh, to give rise to the concept of dignity tends to come about. Well, well so you're certainly right uh, in saying that sort of my focusing on the court teaching about what we now understand the social meaning to be um, does not answer the question or is a different question than how did we arrive at that changed social meaning. And yes, I think there's, there's actually a huge literature on this for all kinds of discrimination, both in law and in political science, the interplay in social movements between litigation strategies and legis uh, legislative strategies and public education. I think just to sketch it in a very basic way, looking back you know, at the, at the early days of the same sex marriage movement in the mid-1990s, a conscious decision was made to file those cases in state courts to limit the spillover effects to avoid a case getting to the Supreme Court too soon. Um, it generates backlash, yes, but the early successful decisions in place like, places like Massachusetts and Iowa, um, I, I think, spark discussion. So the, the, one of, the, one of the, the, the most important sort of theoreticians of the same-sex marriage movement, Evan Wolfson, who has spoken from this podium, and many of you know that name, talked, you know, when I first brought him here in 1996 uh, to IU about his faith that, you know, look, people get to talking when, when a court decides a case, no matter how it comes out, when newspapers write about it, when a bill gets introduced, it causes people to talk. It causes people to uh, uh, re-examine their own assumptions. More importantly, I think I, I have said in, in other contexts that I think the coming out movement was the single most important factor, um, what political scientists uh, have referred to as sort of the associational effects, um, that when people come to realize they have a friend, a family member, a coworker who's gay or lesbian, it changes their attitudes, it makes them more receptive. So I, I, I think that this question of the push and pull between court decisions and public dialogue and attitudinal change, which then paves the way for other court decisions, uh, is a complex business and certainly is something that has been written about and something that at least deserves some background treatment in this. It's related, to, again, to this phenomenon of popular constitutionalism, this idea that courts and judges live in the same culture as the rest of us and, and, and get pushed in particular directions um, by, in part in response to changes that are bubbling up around them, changes in public attitudes, changes in legislative attitudes. I hope that's at least something to start to an answer. Yeah, very good. Uh, th uh, Steve, I thought that was a, a terrific talk. Just to maybe you could say a little bit more about the impact of the Supreme Court itself mm -hmm. in contributing to social meaning. I, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, for example, suppose Obergefell had been decided the other way, right. five to four. Would the social understanding of same-sex marriage today be different? Uh, and if so, to what extent? In other words, to what extent might this be, to some extent, a self-fulfilling prophecy? When the court decides a case, does it push social meaning substantially? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess sort of a related question is, is to the extent the Supreme Court plays, as you put it, sort of a teaching role, or as Justice Kennedy may have put it, um, are we at risk of losing that teaching role to the extent the Supreme Court, maybe at least in the current moment, is being perceived to be more of a partisan institution as opposed to a uh, you know, more neutral mm -hmm. uh, body who, that is interpreting social meaning instead of creating it? Uh, on the first question, and, and just to be clear, when I talk about social meaning, I'm not talking so much about the social meaning, say, of same-sex marriage. I'm talking about the social meaning of laws that prohibit same-sex marriage. And if the court had gone the other way, presumably that would have meant the court was saying, no, we do not understand these laws to impose stigma, to be demeaning, uh, uh, something that very much like what Judge Sutton wrote in the Sixth Circuit. These are just reasonable attempts by people to change public policy and they're entitled to do so. I mean, I, I think that, I would hope that the, the public reaction to that would have been the Supreme Court got that wrong, that the Supreme Court is validating uh, an, a, a disingenuous understanding about these laws, a law, uh, uh, is validating an understanding that doesn't take fully into account um, the, the energy and the meaning and the uh, sort of demeaning consequences behind these laws. So I would think that if we're still living in the world we are today where 
acceptance of same-sex marriage increased, that, that decision would be unpopular. It would be seen as out of sync with, uh, with our current evolving political morality, as you have put it, and wouldn't stand for very long because of that. Uh, again, popular constitutionalism, and in, in that concept doesn't mean that the court always achieves the right decision, but it means that if, a, if the court comes down to a decision for which there is substantial and sustained opposition, a continuing drumbeat that the court just doesn't get it and got it wrong, that would undermine the basis for that decision and lead eventually to a change. So I guess that's the way I would think uh, about social meaning. But, but uh, again, I think to, to touch on something both you and Seth alluded to, of course, the court's decisions do themselves alter social meaning and contribute to social meaning in important ways. And um, sure, I, I think the fact that the, 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 the extent to which the court becomes politicized and very predictable in its decisions um, does undermine its legitimacy. It, it's, you know, this may be a bit pompous for Justice Kennedy to say, by our opinions we teach. It, it implies that most people are actually reading these opinions and the, the rationale behind them as opposed to just giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to the result. Um, but sure, I, I, I would not disagree with that at all. Uh, and, and in my con law class and maybe yours, we spend time talking about things like why Justice Roberts voted the way he did in the Affordable Care Act because the court has to be concerned with its legitimacy and not being perceived as just completely in hoc to partisan politics. I wonder if you could comment on any relationship between privacy jurisprudence and dignity jurisprudence. You said privacy jurisprudence. Um, I, I think so. I, I think you know. Also, another case that uh, that I discuss in the Fuller paper that there wasn't time to talk about. Is certainly, Griswold cases like Griswold, cases like Roe. Um, although, again, they don't use the word dignity. Refer to that same kind of. Uh, the same impulse, this, you know, uh, uh, Griswold is very much the, you know, casting aside, the, putting aside the sort of penumbras and emanations, the formal sort of doctrinal basis that Justice Douglas tried to construct. Um, the court is full of rhetoric about, you know, invading the sacred precincts of the marital bedroom and so forth. It's clear from the history of that litigation um, that uh, it, it was intended to emphasize uh, the appalling idea of married couples having their privacy invaded. So I think in that sense, privacy and dignity are related. And, and Lawrence further shows that Lawrence doesn't use the word privacy as much. Justice Kennedy refers much more to liberty, but it's certainly in the line of right of privacy cases doctrinally. And, and, and there again, Justice Kennedy talks again uh, uh, about dignity, uh, the presumption being that behind that case there was a relationship there, there was something more substantial than just a sexual encounter, and that is what gave it, that was sort of what endowed it with the dignity that, th that then entitled it to the protection of liberty and privacy. Inga and then uh, my Sorry, student Delma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. This is wonderful to listen to, but I have a, a slightly less uh, doctrinal question, and that is if you talk about, if the court or when the court talks about dignity in those cases, uh, let's assume that the social meaning kind of uh, of these cases is swinging the other side in the future. Do you think the use of dignity now in these cases kind of stops the court from, it's the final say on, the, on these cases rather than, uh, you know, reversing itself in the future. Because once you have established what is dignity in particular circumstances, I would think it's very difficult to overturn that in the future. Is, is that kind of setting the bar higher? Well, so I, I think... I, I do view that as a doctrinal question okay. because I think Sorry. the way. Well, no, but mm -hmm. I think the way I have framed it, mm -hmm. necessarily the answer is um, dignity is is simply a component of how our understanding equal. It, it illustrates how our understanding of equality evolves. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the whole idea here is based on the idea that. Um, the understanding of equality is a dynamic 
process that changes and evolves, and that what is seen as an offense, what is the social, the social meaning of a law as, as being an offense to dignity in one context, in one culture, at one time, um, may be different than another. I, I guess my practical answer is to say I don't see, I, I think the consensus on same-sex marriage and uh, seeing sexual orientation as a kind of morally neutral characteristic, I don't see that changing. I think that's just part of a larger um, a, a, a sort of an, in Fourth Amendment terms, moving toward a more uh, sort of just and humane mm -hmm. society. I mean, I, I just don't see that as something as transitory um, that, that that it's likely to change. But that just underscores the idea that the court has to be careful that it needs to reserve using this kind of dignity analysis when it is certain that this isn't just a transitory change, but this is at least an emerging consensus, and that that. Uh, 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 attitudes on this view or uh, on this matter are going in one direction and are not going to turn back. That's that's very promising. Right? <laughs> and then. Uh, I'm not sure how related this this question is to the one beforehand, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, since many, very few states had uh, gay marriage passed through legislation prior to the court decisions, mm -hmm. I, I think the counter-majoritarian counter difficulty is something that would come up. So with possible shifts in the Supreme Courts over the next few years, do you think there could be a rollback of the Dignity Doctrine or possibly a total change? Well, so I, 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 I just, my prediction is, not, I don't think Obergefell is going to be overturned. I don't think Lawrence is going to be overturned. I don't think we're going to see a rollback in that sense. I don't think the court is going to move to a position that oh, laws that, that prohibit same-sex marriage, those are just necessary and proper. Those don't demean anybody. I, I think it, how the court, the contexts in which the court uses dignity may change. I think uh, in this tension between um, LGBT rights and religious liberty, which I'm not really prepared to attempt to resolve definitively in this paper, I think we will see the court, perhaps especially now because of uh, Justice Gorsuch, giving more weight to dignitary interests based on religious liberty, to the dignitary interests of religious believers. It'll, or it'll at least make it much less clear cut that these laws have a social meaning that necessarily means, as the Mississippi court said, this is just about putting LGBT people in their place. It's going to make that kind of analysis, I think, just more, the court may not use it, because again, I think dignity is used when the court senses there's a consensus that it can put its imprimatur on. And, and, and just to say a word about the counter-majoritarian difficulty, I, I've also, you know, everything I've said here is really based on public attitudes and public opinion, not necessarily patterns of enacted laws, which is another way of looking at social consensus. I've, I've said in other writing that that's a bad way of thinking about the same-sex marriage cases because they, most, of the, most of those laws were put in constitutional amendments that were impo nearly impossible to eradicate uh, for a minority group that even if the legislatures of Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Michigan, all the cases in Obergefell had changed their mind about same-sex marriage through the normal democratic process, that wouldn't have made any difference because there was still a constitutional amendment. So um, I'm, I'm more focused on public ad, uh, on social consensus is revealed in ways that don't necessarily that aren't necessarily reflected in the pattern of enacted state law so that you know if you are then you see these cases as more of a counter majoritarian difficulty on the other hand as i said in class if you'd taken a plebiscite national plebiscite on the day that obergefell had was decided a majority of americans would have agreed with it david thanks uh, am i right about the seventh circuit <laughs> Yeah, you never know how the votes may shake out. But uh, thanks very much for the thoughtful lecture, Steve. Um, and you, you, you took away the religious question I was going to uh, uh, just put on the table for you. Um, but I was wondering if you might want to consider exploring uh, with this concept a couple of additional directions. One is um, the dignity of people with disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, which have, uh, who have, have largely been neglected by constitutional doctrine mm -hmm. of equal protection. And I wonder whether that might be a, a, a fruitful area for consideration. Um, and the second, um, you mentioned the Eighth Amendment earlier briefly, um, but it has to do with uh, dignity interests of both convicted prisoners who 
have are subject to, to a lot of punishment. That's the idea. Um, but uh, I think I heard yesterday that more than 20% of the people in custody in the United States are in pretrial custody, mm -hmm. um, not yet convicted, mm -hmm. still entitled to a presumption of innocence, and yet frequently subjected to various forms of humiliation mm -hmm. through routine um, jail practices. And I just offer those as, as potential areas for you to think about. Yeah, and, and, and we actually, uh, it was a, a more of a closed program because of the issues that involved, but we actually had a program under the auspices of, of the REMAC lecture, um, a, a smaller program exploring just that, someone who, with a personal experience of that kind of um, uh, uh, pre-charged detention and the dignity offenses that were sort of going on there. Um, I, I guess I'll have to think about, I'm, I'm, I, I would like to try to keep this project specifically focused on the 14th Amendment because, as you say, dignity has been talked about in Eighth Amendment and Fourth Amendment and other kinds of cases. And, 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 and disability, um, I would need to become more familiar kind of with what the current issues are that are being litigated. I'd say Cleburne actually, you know, goes there to some extent. I mean, Cleburne weighs the idea of making uh, at least the mentally handicapped, the intellectually challenged, a, f a suspect class, and says no, but but labels, you know, draw, is not afraid to draw the conclusion that this particular policy that is being enforced in this Texas city seems to be based on nothing other than irrational prejudice. So the court kind of being candid there about purpose, again, might be a way of saying it's kind of taken the dig taken dignitary concerns into account. But I'd like to talk with you more about that. I intercepted the microphone on its way out. Um, okay. I thought it was a wonderful talk as well. Thank you so much. I had a question about um, what specific mechanism do you envision the Supreme Court using, like the nine justices, yeah. to determine um, when the social meaning of a discriminatory harm has become this kind of unconstitutional dignitary violation. Because um, just earlier you're talking about how maybe uh, the pattern of, of statutes being passed across states isn't the right way to do it. I think the court does that with its Eighth Amendment jurisprudence with, jurisprudence with the evolving standards of decency. And they'll look at like state legislation and like if it's all going in one direction, they'll say, oh, well, this is part of our kind of evolving understanding of uh, kind of cruel and unusual punishment. Right. But if, if it's not that, I mean, is it kind of like a, a national polling, or it, it seems like it seems like kind of a hard question to ask? And it also, I'll end my question here, but it seems like dignitary as a concept is particularly um, prone to be uh, different based on a justice's priors, based on his cultural background and what his kind of sociocultural understanding of what is, you know, a dignitary harm. And given kind of our monolithic uh, Supreme Court, you know, justices who has kind of very, you know, not entirely similar backgrounds, but in, in many extent, to many extents, like similar backgrounds, I wonder if there's some problems there where we'll be relying more on the kind of their priors of what is or isn't a dignitary harm, or if there's some kind of objective other criteria that they can and should be using. Yeah, I, I, I mean, sure. I, I mean, a judge being influenced by his or her subjective values is always a problem. I mean, I, you put your finger on a, on, on a tension in this is that, you know, we don't want constitutional law just being made by public opinion poll or by plebiscite. On the other hand, when, when it is individual rights involved, um, you know, political process doctrine and so forth teaches us to not necessarily understand things like patterns of enacted laws for all the reasons I talked about in, in uh, about same-sex marriage case, all this rhetoric about just let the normal democratic process work I think was disingenuous because uh, again these things had been embedded in state constitutional amendments I think you know we, we just have to I, I think the understanding of dignity should be as objective as possible some of it obviously does come from public attitudes from the court from the, the individual justices awareness of how the world around them has changed um, it, it's something that's easier to sort of articulate in general terms, I guess, than to say uh, there, there, there obviously is no precise formula for this. And I guess the ultimate test is when the court you know, puts out an opinion that's based on dignity logic and that opinion is accepted, generally, that it doesn't cause 
backlash. It, we, it doesn't cause the kind of long-term conflict that, say, a Roe did. But when it, you know, cases like um, Lawrence and Obergefell sort of landed and, 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 you know, what are the consequences? A few pockets of resistance, but no widespread efforts to overturn this or to, you know, we've seen some efforts in some places, Texas, North Carolina, to sort of almost act out, lash out at gay and lesbian couples, but I think those are isolated. So, one way of answering the question, I guess, is simply the test of, of, of the authentic, whether the uh, court's reading of the social meaning of the discrimination is authentic or not, is how the decision comes to be accepted by the public. And if it's not accepted, kind of going back to Dan's question, um, this understanding of constitutional law is kind of a dialogic process between the court and the people will push the court in a different direction or maybe cause the court to, to overturn that. But I, I think it's, it is based on public attitudes. It's based on the, the, the justice's sense of recent history on, uh, as Kennedy says and Lawrence, you know, our own history and traditions of the past 50 years are the most relevant for looking at the history uh, uh, of the impact of sodomy laws, not more ancient uh, traditions. Uh, uh, changes in law in states can, ha can be a part of that as well. So I think that is something I'm obligated to say more about in the paper is what are the factors that this is looking at without just saying the court sticks its finger in the wind or looks at the latest public opinion poll. It's clearly got to be something more than that, but you know, it is a sort of the court's perception of the social consensus. And, and, and I might say even if some justices might think, I guess I think it's possible that a, that a justice might agree that the law uh, is demeaning to this particular group but still think that it's sort of some sort of valid purpose or that, uh, yes, it's demeaning, but it's the role of the legislature to, to take care of that, not courts. That, to me, is a different question, whether the court is empowered or entitled to act um, to invalidate a law based on that kind of understanding of dignity as opposed to saying, okay, I agree with you, it's a silly law, it's demeaning, but that is not a question of constitutional significance. That's up to the legislature to decide. Okay, other questions? All right, great, thank you so much.